Hello and welcome to the East Hampton Library to this evening's event. Uh, this is Steve Spatero, Head of Adult Reference uh, at the East Hampton Library. Before we get, begin tonight, I just would like to let everybody know that they could obtain a link of this evening's event at our website, easthamptonlibrary.org, um, or you can go on to YouTube and our our YouTube account is E-H-A-M-L-I-B, E-H-A-M-L-I-B. And uh, tonight we have uh, Joan Baum this evening who will be uh, speaking about Bloomsday uh, and uh, James Joyce and his 1922 work, Ulysses. And without further ado, I'd like to turn over this evening's lecture to Joan Baum. Till the next blue day. So we are the earliest and the first to get into the action. Um, <clears throat> if this were Ulysses, which takes place over 18 hours of a day, in the book it would be six o'clock, and the six o'clock chapter in the book takes place in a pub, Kiernan's pub. It's toward the end of a, a meeting with a whole bunch of the guys, including Leopold Bloom. So we should really, I mean, I'm grateful for the library, but we should really be for authenticity in a pub. Um, anyway, this talk has two parts, and I'm going to sound a bit teacherly there. I made this up. It could have been three parts, <laughs> but I made it two. And each of the parts has sections, because we're talking about a book that is incredibly challenging, both in its structure and style. The first part of my talk will be, why are we having this talk? What's to recommend this book? What's with it? And I got 10 reasons. I could have had seven, could have had 11. But again, I'm affecting an order. I'm imposing this artificially just to keep us in, in time. And the second part, which will be short and is hardly original, but I'd like to engage you in talk at that point, will be if you are interested in pursuing this book, reading it or trying to read it, how might you do it? How might I suggest as I suggested to myself, the best way to do that. At that point, you will probably hear me, if not earlier, very critical of the people with whom I shared collegiality throughout my entire professional years, teachers. When I first came across Ulysses, I was 18, and it was the 60s, and it was full of rebellion, and I had just come off Portrait of the Artist as a Young Man with its marvelous statement, I'm leaving country, family, tradition. Yeah, you go. And then along comes this book. It's a book that has been raked over the coals. It's a book that is incredibly difficult in parts, and it's still difficult for me. Uh, I wanted, and I also want to say, that I am no Joyce scholar. I wanted to be, and when I applied to graduate school, we had to choose a century. So, like everyone else I knew affected kids, we all chose the 20th century where the action was. And I got back a postcard. I'm not making this up. Dear Joan, sorry to tell you, but the 20th century is closed. So I drifted with pleasure, as it turned out, to the early 19th century. Uh, and the big guys, Wordsworth, Coleridge, Byron, Shelley, Keats, followed by the big girls, particularly Jane Austen. Uh, academics are possessive. They are highly competitive. And this is particularly true of James Joyce scholars. Although probably, you 
come in here at the end if you have a difference, probably not as competitive or filled with ownership as Jane Austen readers. They are, <laughs> yeah, they are the living end. So anyway, the preliminary remarks I wanted to make was that one, I'm not a Joyce scholar. I'm also assuming something about you and the people on Zoom as an audience. I'm assuming that, one, you haven't read the book, some of you, but have heard about it. Or you read it a long time ago, in whole or in part, and you probably will not try again. But I'm also assuming that you have some general sense of what the book is about, and I'll go through that as a kind of fast overview. Uh, the editor of a very well-known journal in this country said, and I think he's accurate, Ulysses is the most purchased and least read book in the world. World. It's probably the most annotated. Editions keep on coming out uh, with people writing long scholarly notes Line so-and-so, page so-and-so, episode so-and-so has Bloom saying, uh, I have no ha, H-A. Well, it should be hat. No, it shouldn't. It should be ha. <laughs> Joyce knew. Anyway, uh, you know broadly that Ulysses is a narrative that takes place in one day. And that day is June 16th. It starts for 18 hours early in the morning at 8, and it concludes late at night the next day in the kitchen. Uh, it concludes, that is, the relationship between Leopold Bloom, one of the major characters, and Stephen Dedalus from Portrait of the Artist. But the last episode in the book, which is probably the most famous, has directly nothing to do with them. It's a soliloquy by Molly Bloom in bed, and she's just had an affair with Blazes Boylan, and she's kind of reviewing her life, and it is an incredible stream of consciousness soliloquy that actresses love to do, and they have. So basically, it's a story about the peregrinations of Leopold Bloom, who's one of the characters, main characters. 38, he's married to Molly, stand-up guy. The other main character is, as I said, left over from Portrait of the Artist, and that's Stephen Dedalus. He's an intellectual, and he is lonely, he's moody, he's incredibly fast, sharp, and witty. So you have a narrative that has two main characters, but you have them in an odd kind of structure. The 18 episodes or chapters of Ulysses break down to one and three, where you're following Stephen Dedalus, his thoughts, his friends, his wanderings. Then chapters or episodes four to 17, he appears, Stephen, but basically you're following Leopold Bloom. Then they wind up in his kitchen having tea. And then the famous episode 18, which is Molly Bloom in bed. You also, I think, have heard, or if you've heard sections of the Molly Bloom soliloquy, you know that each character has his or her own inner thought style. And there are other characters in the book, too, by the way, maybe close to 100. Uh, and one of them nobody can identify and is still the source of many scholarly articles. A mysterious figure appears, and he's identified as the man in a Macintosh. Boom looks at him and wonders who he is, and he resurfaces later, and no one knows who he is. 
And all I have to say about that is stop the articles. Joyce knew exactly what he was doing. He was a mischievous prankster, as well as an absolute genius. And he has said, what I've got here is going to keep the academics busy for years and years and years. And he loved it. He was also an incredibly witty guy. And although he had a wonderful description of Finnegan's Wake, I thought it would be uh, wonderfully apt for talking about Ulysses. And that is that he called it a Meanderthal tale. <laughs> and that's exactly what it is. So we have this story about these three central figures. You also probably heard that one of the reasons it's so difficult to understand is because of the basic overall style, stream of consciousness. And that raises questions about how readable it is in parts. But there are sections of this book that are so incredibly accessible and sections that are so funny and sections that are so filthy. Um, so that you have different styles. In fact, at one point, Bloom is thinking about his marriage when he first met Molly and what's happened now. I should say that some of you may know this, that they haven't had sex in 10 years. And the reason that they haven't is his terror of having a child. They had a baby and the baby died at 11 days and he just could not accept that trauma. So leaves open Molly's needs, leaves open his needs too, but not together. And that's an important part of the book. So these 18 episodes, as I said, um, I haven't mentioned something that the academics love to point out. You may also have heard that Ulysses is based on or follows the Odyssey. And there have been some famous books explication. One, I love the guy's name, Stuart Gilbert, because I think of Gilbert Stuart, who did all the Washington portraits in, in schools. But Stuart Gilbert uh, wrote a book where he said, OK, here's Homer, here's Joyce. Here's Homer, here's Joyce. And goes through and identifies everything, every correspondence that he can find. I'm unhappy with that, and I'm going to say why later on, and hope you avoid that uh, without sounding too uh, daunting. So we have a book that's structurally and stylistically challenging. I should also mention that that most famous episode, Molly Bloom's Soliloquy, is composed of only eight sentences. When you're not bombed out trying to read it, find out where the punctuation is. Uh, and then the stream just goes on. So we have different kinds of styles, different episodes, and I found rereading it very difficult in parts. Arguably for me, of the 18, pick it up, avoid episode 14, uh, which is called Oxen of the Sun. It takes place in a birthing hospital. Someone whom Bloom knows is having a bad time in labor. And he goes to visit her. He's such a nice guy, very sensitive. And in this chapter, what Joyce does is go through the fact that they're at a birthing hospital and there are doctors who are sitting around, doctoral students, I should say, doctor students. And what he does is go through that episode starting with a kind of Anglo-Saxon patina and takes you through the entire episode which is taking you through the birth and evolution and development 
of the English language. And I, who studied this, couldn't pick up what I later read. Oh, so that was Sir Philip Sidney he was parodying. Oh, and so it was John Milton, his, one of his poems that's here. I couldn't follow it. I, couldn't, I, I could identify maybe the period, Shakespeare as opposed to Chaucerian, as opposed to Anglo-Saxon, but it can be maddening. And it was very difficult to do that. Could you read it without doing that? In this episode, I think probably not without a lot of guidance. So I'm going to also suggest that, if you want, ignore the episodes or the sections that are difficult if you want to try this. So now, why did I decide I wanted to give a talk, subject you to it for the reasons that we're here to talk about Ulysses the day after Bloom's Day. Well, it's now the 100th anniversary of the publication of Ulysses, which was in Paris in 1922. And it was published by a woman by the name of Sylvia Beach, who owned a bookstore. And this occurs also on Joyce's 40th birthday, which she did deliberately. Virginia Woolf was asked to publish it. She refused. She disliked Joyce a lot. And I thought about why. I don't have a reason. I don't have the reason. She didn't like him. I thought it was a matter of class. But I don't think it was anything in the content that put her off. I may be wrong, but they were also quite competitive because Joyce's stream of consciousness style that he made famous, he didn't invent it, and he was certainly not the only one writing in it. She was too, and she was very good at it. But I must say, hoping I don't offend anyone, Joyce uh, really did it much better and much, in much more innovative ways. So she refused to publish it, and she was, would have been a terrific person to do so. And Gertrude Stein, who was the powerhouse in Paris at this time, uh, didn't like it. Didn't like him either too much, but really did not like the book. And she really exerted a lot of power. She knew everybody, and she and Joyce attempted to be friends, but he got on her nerves. He could be a practical joker. He was always pinching her fat. And she, in revenge, knowing that he was half blind, was always leading him into doors. Um, so, but her friends, her buddies, her clan, disagreed. Hemingway called Ulysses a goddamned wonderful book as did Ezra Pound and T.S. Eliot. He had a lot of American supporters. And F. Scott Fitzgerald not only loved it, but loved it <laughs> to an extreme where, and you can see this on YouTube if you Google it, he was dying to meet Joyce. He said, I've never, this guy is the genius of all geniuses. And he got Sylvia Beach to have a dinner party and Joyce came, and there is a sketch that he made of the table. Joyce is at one end with a halo, and F. Scott Fitzgerald is groveling on the floor. And according to reports, including Joyce's, he said at one point, I would do anything. You are just a god, a genius. I would throw myself out the window if you asked at which Joyce said, I think the man is mad. Um, but the adoration was there. So interestingly enough, although the book contains the famous Molly Bloom soliloquy, which has more about menstruation, <laughs> perhaps, than anyone ever cared to have, that was unusual, uh, it earned most of its admirers 
from women. Women, in fact, in New York, too, in particular, who had a literary review, started publishing Ulysses here in, in little sections until the courts caught up. And as you know, the book was banned. Another reason uh, I like the book is because the man with whom I've fallen deeply in love over the last couple of years and gave a talk on George Orwell adored it. He read it and wrote a 2,000 word letter to Joyce saying this was just the most extraordinary thing he had read. He said he was haunted by sections and he said what I'm going to say and what most of you probably will intuit that the way to do this book is to read it out loud. And that's what Orwell did. So there's another anniversary, however, not just 1922 and the publication of this book in Paris, but there's another anniversary that Joyce absolutely knew about. And in 1904, when the book is set, June 16th, 1904, the day on which the in hours takes place, there was a huge anti-Semitic series of incidents in Limerick. Uh, Jews were killed, Jews were vandalized, many who could left. And one of the oddest but most sympathetic aspects to this book, he once said, this is a book about Ireland and Israel, a book about Christians and Jews. And the parallels, of course, are there, ironically, in a book called Ulysses, which invokes the Greeks. So that is certainly one of the reasons uh, I wanted to talk about the book. As I said, it has these double anniversaries. It's almost 90 years ooh, uh, when United States versus one book called Ulysses in 1933 ruled that the book was not obscene and could enter the United States legally. Before that, people were smuggling it in. But Bernard Cerf, who owned Random House, was very eager to have the book cleared in the courts. And so he alerted everybody, you who obscene book arriving at the harbor, and he made sure that people there confiscated it. And there were two court cases, one to see if it could reverse the first. And the first was by a judge, Judge John Woolsey, whose decision that the book was not obscene has become part of the literature of the book because it's a very eloquent defense of literature. Wrote in the, his ruling in December 1933, the book was not pornographic in intent. There was no leer of the sensualist. And he noticed the astonishing success of the stream of consciousness technique with Anglo-Saxon words familiar to all readers. And then he said, the book may be in places emetic, vomiting, but it's not aphrodisiac. And I think he's correct. Um, the United States appealed Woolsey's decision in 1934. Uh, by the way, the Woolsey decision was two to one in the book's favor. And the appeal group also ruled two to one. And then it was up to us. Read it. Third reason, Boom's Day. You've all heard about it. What is it? It's a celebration that began shortly after the publication of the book in Paris. And it was mentioned, in fact, by Joyce. He says, a group of people observe what they call Bloom's Day, June 16th, 1904. Why that date? Well, the original critics, and as far as I know, took a long time to acknowledge the truth, said that was the day 
that Joyce met his partner and later wife, Nora Barnacle. And that's not quite true because he met her five days earlier in Finn's pub. She was a chambermaid. And the date of June 16th, therefore, is not the day that they met, but the day that they had their first date and she masturbated him. And he wrote, that was great, and you've helped me become a man, though he had gone to prostitutes before that. So it's a date that celebrates, and I, I want that record clear, not their meeting, that's a romantic, sentimental view, but a sexual exchange. And sensuality and sex are very much a part of this book. And I think that's why women particularly love it, because um, it acknowledges women's sexuality. Side note, I just thought of it. I just read a book for review just out from Yale or Casanova about that Casanova, the serial adulterer, seducer. And I was fascinated. It's very well written. I was fascinated because he was unique as a seducer. He did not at all turn away women's pleasure. In fact, he was as excited about checking that women had as good a time as he. And that was highly unusual for the late 17th, early 18th century. And it was probably still unusual in Joyce's day. So he and Nora Barnacle, wonderful last name, uh, when, Joyce, when um, Joyce's father heard that they were eloping, they didn't get married for some time, he said, well, with a name like that, she's going to hang on. I will say this. When I was in graduate school, um, and like most students, arrogant and selfish and not at all experienced, we were all the literati. We're all upset that our genius, James Joyce, should attach himself chambermaid. I mean, come on, he deserved, he was a genius, he deserved better. He deserved what he wanted and what he got. And when you go home, and I don't think you're going to forget this, get on to Google and Google the letters that James Joyce wrote to Nora while they were still kind of courting, that's an odd word. They, and he says to her, I hope these are filthy enough for you. They are really still, I think today, surprising, if not shocking. Scatological, sure, but how about coprophily, which means love of feces. I go no further, I'm sure you will read the letters. I don't know how they're still on there and how they escaped all the people who were screaming about the obscenity in the book. The letters are just incredible. Alas, we don't have hers. They were destroyed. And uh, James Joyce's grandson, who died uh, about a year or two ago, uh, was quite the guardian of Joyce's reputation. And uh, so much so, that no new edition could come out without the grandson, whose name was Stephen, uh, the imprimatur. So do look them up, and you will find the most amazing exchange. Well, there weren't exchanges. You can gather what her responses were, because he alludes to them. But the language is unbelievable. Blunt raw, coarse, and marvelous. And of course it was as long as it lasted before he got blind and became very difficult and alcoholic. Um, it was exactly what he wanted. And obviously she, uh, who had experience, knew what 
she wanted as well. So, new editions keep coming out. Another reason to keep on being interested in Ulysses. And annotated editions particularly. In fact, the New York Times uh, a couple of months ago had a huge uh, piece on someone who came out with an illustrated Ulysses. People are always trying to come out with some pictures that will somehow embody what they see as the essence of the book. Um, Joyce was not particularly interested in having an illustrated edition of Ulysses, um, though he did try to interest Picasso and Matisse. Stein, Gertrude Stein, said to Picasso, don't go near that man. That ended that. Matisse did wind up doing an illustrated edition, but he didn't rely on Joyce's Ulysses. He relied on Homer's. And you can see pictures of this, so it's really not at all relevant. But I don't think you need that. Reason five, historical and cultural significance. What fascinates me is that it was composed, most of it from 1914 on to 21, when Joyce was 32 years old in 1914, 40% of the book was already out. And it comes out at a time that is still referred to by the critics as the time of the lost generation. Hemingway, Fitzgerald, all the biggies, the poets, the essayists, the novelists, no matter if they were left or right, this was the hot time, the jazz age. And here is this book, and it is so unlike anything that came out at that time. I find that incredible. It's a book that looks back in exile. He left Ireland to write about Dublin. And in fact, he once said, should Dublin ever be destroyed, it could be reconstructed from my book. And people have verified that. Six, its reputation. I still think that there are people who don't appreciate, because it's so hard to get in, the fact that the book is very funny. It's incredibly witty. The puns are convoluted. They're multiple. Every time I take a look at some of them, I, I oh, I didn't see this. Or they're, because they're multiple, they, they just keep on building up. And as someone said, all of the work on Ulysses proves that Joyce is no longer a Joyce in the wilderness. He would have rejected that. That wasn't clever enough for him. But the more, well, let me put it this way. I review, and someone would say to me, well, what's a good book? Not meaning a recommendation, but what is your value system? And my answer is very simple. It's a book or a poem that I would reread, and knowing that in the rereading, I will always find something new. It may change the view I had when I was younger. It probably just accretes with wonderful meaning based on the fact that I'm older. But that's what I say about this book. Even if you just turn to it in parts that you think you know, even the Molly Bloom soliloquy, and you'll see things that you haven't seen before. So I think its reputation is well deserved, but what you'll finally see is the most difficult parts of the book to pick up the humor. It really, the guy's got a great sense of humor. He was proficient in many languages, and that is related to the fact that he was at heart a musician. As I said, he was a tenor, he had a superb voice, and he, you can hear him. I, I found four minutes of his reciting one of the chapters from Ulysses. So it's on YouTube, and you'll hear a high tenor. You'll hear a lot of brog, too, and it'll be very difficult to follow what he's saying. But it, the, the quality of the tenor uh, was fascinating. And the 
languages he knew. He kept on adding as the older he got, and he added them with the ease of a musician. And we forget that music, like mathematics, is the only universal language in the world. And so he grew as a musician when he learned all these new languages, including Hebrew and Yiddish. They're in there, and they're in there more than his spots. Seven. Ulysses, in whole but mainly in parts, is still turning up in the theatrical and musical world. There are dramas, films, dance, recordings, mixed media, artwork. Everything has been taken from this book. It's a mine, a gold mine of recordings and visual delight. Many years ago, um, again, no offense to the Jainites, I was a little tired of going to the James Joyce Society. <laughs> I was 20 and looking for a little more action than watercress sandwiches. And the Gotham Book Mart was hosting the James Joyce Society. Well, that was a difference. So I joined, and I came in the first night, and the guy at the door said, oh, are you in for a treat? And as they start talking, you could hear out in the hall jingling noises and tap. Zero Mostel as Leopold Bloom, Burgess Meredith as Blazes Boylan were coming down the aisle, practicing what would then go on and finally arrive on Broadway as Ulysses in Night Town, a reference to the brothel or Circe episode of the book. They were incredible, and Zero Mostel was absolutely out of this world with his derby hat. And I've often wondered, and maybe you can wonder along with me, you remember the producers, springtime, springtime for Hitler in Germany. What's the name of the, of the, the character in the book? Bialystok and Bloom, and what's Bloom's first name? Leo. There isn't a doubt in my mind that it was probably by way of Zero Mostel. He says, listen, got a character? Let's do Leopold Bloom or Leo. And that was true. So when you see that movie again, listen for Bialystok and Bloom and Gene Wilder saying, oh, Leo, oh, Leo. Um, it was wonderful. And they were terrific in it. He won awards. So Ulysses in Nighttime, I hope someday will come back, and it may even be a film. So that is certainly the, the hold it has on the imagination, that it keeps on you know, producing new adaptations, and particularly theatrical ones. Also, this book has spurred an industry. I don't know of another writer who has so many societies, foundations, institutes, periodicals, centers all over the world. With this mystery, which I cannot fathom, how did this book get translated so it went all over the world? I mean, for most of us, it's translation from English to English. Um, I have no idea. But these are devoted acolytes, even if they haven't read the book. They are somehow attracted to it almost viscerally, and that's another reason to be fascinated by the book. So finally, two more reasons, and for me, these are the main reasons why I thank you for listening to me go on about this book. It is a positive book. Not just because the last word of the book is, yes, how many books can you think of today that would have, you know, not even perhaps, uh, but it is a positive book. It's a look at real people, their inner thoughts, and it avoids cliche and stereotype. Yes, Bloom, who never got off over the loss of a son, and Stephen Dedalus, who 
does not relate to his father. Father and son, they find each other in the kitchen and they have a kind of ecumenical exchange, it's said, over tea. But they don't go out and are suddenly changed. The book doesn't end, you know, and now they have buddies in each other. They disagree. They disagree more than they agree. But the fact that they agree in different ways, for me, is significant. And it's the main reason, I think, that the book has as its main draw for me a humanity that is so unusual, particularly today. And it's a humanity that comes right out of the style. It's a book on multiple perspectives, on how to look on love, sex, religion, writing. You name the subject, but they're here and there are different voices. And nothing gets neatly resolved. There's nothing at the end that, you know, you'll never know, for example, at the end of Molly Bloom's soliloquy that ends with the word yes. Yes to what? We can go on forever. Will they have sex again? <laughs> uh, will the love that they have or the trust in each other surmount the difficulties? Will she have another fling with Blazes Boylan, probably. So nothing ties up neatly, and that's the kind of world Joyce explored, and even more, the kind of world we're living in now, full of ambiguity, irony, and paradox, where nothing is clearly resolved, except your sense that this is an incredibly humane book that shows the striving of people to be with others. This book follows Portrait of the Artist as a Young Man, which most of you probably did read without too much difficulty, and its famous last line, which I'm going to read, because when you're young and you think you're intellectual, you memorize it and you go off to the beach and you recite it to the, to the stars. Oh, I go to encounter, this is Stephen Dedalus. Oh, I go to encounter for the millionth time the reality of experience and to forge in the smithy of my soul the uncreated conscience of my race. Oh, go for it. Protest, aloneness, it just fit in so well with our age and our time, the 60s. And now here he is in episode three, and he appears as the star of the first three episodes of the book. He's at a beach, and he's looking out, and he's just having thoughts. And he says, this is the guy who's going out, you know, to do it all alone, protest, not needing anybody. Touch me. Soft eyes, soft, soft, soft hand, I am lonely here. Oh, touch me soon, now. What is that word known to all men? I am quiet here, alone, sad too. Touch, touch me. And the need for human contact by this guy who's, the chapter kind of turns people off once he says, getting to the beach, Oh, the ineluctable modality of the visible. We all say that when we get to the beach, right? But he is an intellectual. He's trying to assess philosophically what he sees with what he knows. And here he finally comes in very simple, accessible language to say that he's lonely, that he's alone. And he goes not to see anything, but he wants to be to touched. He wants to have that quality. And I think that is just a lovely, lovely point at which to connect Portrait of the Artist and then Ulysses, which is the mature book. And the word alone featured in that little passage I read. And the book he wrote after that, 
Finnegan's Wake begins with an ending, and the words are, Alone, alas, a love along the river run. And first of all, you hear this jazzy rhythm that just kind of pulls you in, but it's the aloneness, it's a marvelous continuation of that, and it's a marvelous exploration that Joyce goes on to do, having to do more with dreams. So I see this book as worth trying. I see it as a book that is a homecoming for Joyce in many ways. And I also see it as a difficult book. And I want to suggest that you try it. And if the first three chapters with Stephen Dedalus are difficult, the opening is very famous. Stately, plump, Buck Mulligan, someone he's living with, comes down from a tower, he's ready to shave. And as you read it, you start bouncing. And you realize this is a musician in front of you. Absolutely, the music will get you. Side issue. Years ago, not long after I joined the James Joyce Society, all us affected kids went down to the White Horse Tavern in Greenwich Village. Who was appearing that night, probably his last appearance, Dylan Thomas bombed out of his head. That's almost redundant. And he started to recite poetry. Now, he's bombed, Welch. <laughs> Most of the people did not know the poems that he was trying to do with his accent. And everybody was moved. And I'm, it wasn't just phony move. They just heard music. And that's what they came to hear. And I think this is what this book, written by this eminent, preeminent musician, has to recommend it. When I was in school, Read Ulysses, we were all told that it was modeled on, as I said, Homer's Odyssey. That in itself is, different, is different. The Odyssey is Greek, the word Ulysses is the, the Roman. And the Stuart Gilbert will make it easy for us because every chapter he's going to annotate and put in graphic mode and show correspondences. I got out my copy of the Odyssey, the Bagel's translation, which is pretty good. And this is how it begins. Sing to me of the man, muse, the man of twists and turns, driven time and again off course, once he had plundered hallowed heights of Troy. Odysseus was no Leopold Bloom. And in fact, the standard epithet that follows him is the wily Odysseus. Comes back at the end after 20 years. Did he need 20 years? OK, 10 for the war, but 10 for his loony escapades. Comes back, and what does he do? He goes straight to all the suitors besieging Penelope and kills them savagely, gleefully. And as that is not enough, he then sets the house on fire. I can't think of a character more at odds with the qualities of Leopold Bloom, who cares about a blind character whom he helps across the street, who goes to a funeral of someone he hardly knows, who withstands the most vicious taunting in a bar because he's a Jew, who, in fact, knows his wife is having an affair and goes along with it, whatever that means. And so it becomes clear to me, if you want to see the parallels, have fun. Joyce was a jokester. But I think what he really was up to was saying, here's heroism. Here is the model. Here are the myths. And this is what my man is doing, Bloom, quite different. Uh, so it's a mock. Joyce, Joyce's Ulysses 
if it's an epic, is a mock epic. And if it is to make us conscious of the Odyssey, it's to be sharply critical and concerning how that kind of a character becomes a modern Ulysses with very different heart and soul. And so I would certainly recommend not falling into any trap of people who are going to make it easy for you and take you through every chapter, particularly one with parallels. I think there are many more differences between Homer and Joyce than similarities. And the similarities that are there are there for irony. The book stands on its own. And so here's what I'm going to suggest. It is hard. Pick it up. Start with chapter four. In chapter four, it's almost that Joyce got tired of Stephen Dedalus. He got chapters one, two, and three. And then he floats around uh, in the rest of the book. But he doesn't hold it the way he held Portrait of the Artist. It's Bloom who is the, the soul and the center. So if the Stephen Dedalus chapters are difficult, skip them. Begin with the fourth when you meet Bloom. He's in a kitchen. He's preparing breakfast for Molly and his cat. And it's accessible. And keep going. And when you get to a section like the one I mentioned with the history of the English language stylistically rep replicated, just skip it. Uh, I'm also going to suggest something that would have been a sin years ago in schools. Pick up the notes about it. What do they call them? Ponies, Sparks Notes, or on YouTube, yeah, Cliff knows where you are. Um, Spark, I think, is now the guy who owns it. Uh, but there are also some wonderful lectures. A guy by the name of Connor. Um, hmm? Yes? Oh, thanks. Um, he's terrific. And he's got a nice, quiet manner. It's not didactic. Listen to what he says. Get an overview of what's coming up. And then read it out. Invite a friend or two friends. I would say no more than that. And go over the book as though you were having a kind of ritual or religious experience. Read it out. It's going to be impossible not to see the music. And even, you know, the, the beginning, as I said, of, of the whole book, stately plump Buck Mulligan came from the stairhead bearing a bowl of lather on which a mirror and a razor lay crossed. And as soon as I got to the lay crossed, I went like this, don't, don't, as though I was scanning a poem. And I realized that the music is taking over. So I think this is a wonderful opportunity just to visit. You know about the book next year, just 364 days away, on Bloomsday. Maybe we can all figure out when Peter getting together and more of us participating and you coming to the book. And I suspect that if you do that a couple of times, even if you don't read it through, you'll have the experience that I did. Every time you want to come back and you'll see something new. And it was, you know, a marvelous opportunity to do that. So I thank you very much for coming here and listening. As I said, if you have any questions or comments, I'd be happy to hear them. Probably I have no comments back. Well, I shouldn't say that. No answers. But this is a great tome. It's not easy. You need heft. But there are many editions, and I have no particular edition to recommend. They're coming out again and again with corrections. And I'm not even sure. And the corrections correct the corrections that came out before. So don't get tied into the academics, scholars who would, I think of a wonderful phrase of John Keats, who would unweave a rainbow. This is it. Thank you so much. <laughs>
A fascinating talk. Thank you. Should we also read the letters of Sylvia Beach to James Joyce? Why not? But read the letters of James Joyce. I mean, the, the actual collection of letters that he wrote to Nora that I mentioned before is no longer in print. Gee, I wonder why. But somehow, and I don't know why these five or six that are uh, on YouTube uh, are there, but they're most, most telling. And you've learned, perhaps, or reminded of the new word coprophilia. Anyone else? Yes. I taught English 12, and we did some world literature short stories. So we read one by Joyce, one by Virginia Woolf. So we discussed this literary technique where they represent the inner workings of a character's mind, and it was on the test. Two of my students on different sides of the room wrote, stream of confusion. <laughs> right. I, I, gave them, I gave them half credit. I wish I'd given them full credit that because they good. got the point. Yes. Yeah. Well done. And I bet the story was the dead. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, Araby. Right, okay. If you want. So, but then should we ever go back and sure. read chapters one, sure. two, three? Sure. I just think that, you know, you should be, if you. Someone said yesterday at the round table we were at that chapter three from which I quoted that very beautifully moving touch me, touch me here. That's the third chapter, that that's it. It's called the sand trap because after that, everything is unintelligible that he says, that he thinks about. Uh, no, certainly go back and try, try it one to three, but don't say, I've had it with this book. I can't understand it. It's all going to be like that. It's not all going to be like that. Or see what the big hula is about with the hoopla, I should say, with, with the chapter 18, Molly Bloom's soliloquy. It's certainly available by incredible actresses who have done that. Siobhan McKenna was the one I heard on Cadman Records a thousand years ago. I still can't see Leopold Bloom. Milo O'Shea did him in a movie as anything but Zero Mostel, <laughs> so I'm ruined. Uh, but go back and forth. Question. Because this was translated into so many different languages, were there any other um, uh, thoughts about banning the book? Because you said some of, you know, it's... Well, it was banned in the United States. Yeah, but any other countries I have it? no idea. That's a good question. It, it was... Thank you, Peter. Well, his uh, home countries were kind of uh, Italy, Trieste, and Zurich, and Paris. Um, Paris was wide open uh, for literature uh, you know, all kinds of art. Great companion piece, and I know I always recommend read the book yourselves. I say read everything. Read it. Go go through the war. What, what are we going to do? Go play golf? Go through the war, Ulysses. It's fun. But the Elman book, his biography by Elman, uh, Elman is the finest. Uh, I think much better than I think it's better than uh, Gilbert's um, thing to have, and it's it's really well written. And of course, the beginning, as you said so well. Um, Portrait of an artist is still one of the most beautiful declarations of independence uh, for an artist or, or anyone. I mean, Actually, I may put a sign out for anybody who wants to come over to my house and start on Finnegan's Wake. I've started the book many times, and I've left off. Um, it's just the opening paragraph you, know, you could spend hours on. But I guess I'm contradicting myself because I said, you don't need to do that. You realize you're not going to get it all. And what do we ever get all of anyway in art? Um, and as Freud would say, what do the authors even get, you know, totally from the unconscious? But it's worth the effort. This is just, when it's beautiful, it is truly beautiful. And again, in a way that the music, even though we're reading it, the irony is I'm saying, listen to it. Some people say, should I 
read it with an audio book. Why not? I mean, I, whatever helps or you think will get you in. The problem with an audio book is that you're hearing finally someone else's interpretation. Uh, this is true in music. Who's playing, you know, and how, how is that person playing or singing? That's always true. But I'd much rather, you know, just read it out. Mm -hmm. Gorgeous. And again, I began by saying that this is a remarkable book. If for no other reason than Joyce in incredible pain and against all odds could hardly see, wrote it and kept writing it. Um, Nora, his wife, was quoted as having said on more than one occasion, I wish he had stayed with music <laughs> and sang. Um, but he knew what he was doing and he would fasten every period, every comma, probably with some errors, but I wouldn't get caught up at all in the academic life of this book, which I think ruined it for a lot of people. I uh, have from the audience uh, at home uh, an observation. I didn't know Virginia Woolf was a publisher. Yes, she was, with her husband, Leonard. And then we have a question. Um, was he looking for backing to publish this work? Sure, you seem to know. Yes, right, desperate for money. Mm -hmm. For obscenity, right, right. Mm -hmm. You know, she she stuck. You're absolutely right, the need for money was always there. And she stuck with him. This was, you know, when it, you know how critical you are. I, you know, I think it was you, Tony, or something about the biography of famous authors. Sometimes it's helpful, sometimes it isn't. Sometimes we just don't know. And I mean, a good rationale for any book ever coming out is I'm going to correct the record. You know, new material has appeared. Uh, and people are always doing this uh, with, with famous authors, musicians, whatever. So I would certainly, I think you're right, Richard Elman's book is terrific. But first, go to the source and just try it. And again, maybe the recommendation is to try that last episode, the Molly Bloom. The problem with that is the people who do that think that they're getting into Ulysses. But it's unique. She doesn't appear anywhere else in the book. And she's in bed, and it's a marvelous theatrical display. But it's not part of the integration of the whole movement of Bloom particularly. This man who is such a good-hearted, sensitive soul, and always trying to help, and ongoing, and it's a wonderful statement about perseverance. Smart also, but smart in a very practical and mechanical way, and he loves food. Um, so maybe if you try to get together with other people, bring a potato. Um, Biographical, not that I know. Stephen Dedalus, yes, right. And Joyce had incredible education. He's very, very bright. But no, Bloom is a uh, from the the uh, familial name was Virag, which means flower. Uh, so he stuck with the uh, the genre, um, and he's a Hungarian Jew, even though he converted. I mean, many Jews converted, but they were still Jews. And what was more important is how his fellows guarded him. Who are you? What is your country? One of them says in the Cyclops chapter in the bar. And he says, Ireland. Them. 
It reminds me again of an old comment by Jean-Paul Sartre, whom I'm not wild about, who once said people were always asking him after the war, how come as Jews who were not really observant, how come, you know, they get sent to the camps? And Sartre looks at them and says, it's not up to you to say who's a Jew. It's up to them. And when they no longer ask you, then you're okay. So he describes something where the visit that you pay to somebody else is worth more than what you say about it, is how you're viewed. Well, one of them, one of them started it in many ways. <laughs> yeah, right. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Peter. Thank you. And if we can conclude um, a famous, yes, please. Yes, uh, but I'm sure they had two children, uh, very sad. Uh, the girl, Lucia, went mad and was, I don't know how mad, but was in an asylum and finally died there. And the son, Giorgio, who had his own child, Stephen, his, Joyce's grandson, they had access to these and they destroyed them. It was what she wanted to. But as I said, they are on YouTube. So... <laughs> By the way, the, uh, throughout the book, uh, Leopold Bloom is thinking of what's going to happen at 4 o'clock when Blazes Boylan comes to visit his wife, Molly. And Blazes is a kind of musical entrepreneur, and they're going off on tour. And she's a singer, by the way. She's a mezzo-soprano. And one of the songs they're going to sing is Peter. <laughs> Just, just a song at mid midnight. What? Well, you sing it too. Let's all, I, I think we all know it. I, just a song, everybody, at twilight when the lights are low and the flickering shadows softly come and go. Oh, the heart be weary and the day and long still to us at twilight comes love's old sweet song comes love's old sweet song thank you for thank coming. you Thank you, Joan. Thank you, everybody, for uh, attending uh, in person and at home. And uh, we look forward uh, to the next event at the East Hampton Library. Thank you. Have a good evening.